Okay, I thought I'd do a beginner's guide to Procreate. I've done a full app guide that goes into all of the details that I think are going to be useful. And there's a link for that if you want to go and look at that in the description. But if you're new to Procreate and you just want to be able to get started and you need to know the basics in order to do that, then this is going to be the video for you. Having said that, since I did the longer tutorial, there have actually been some updates to the app, some additional features, which I'm going to also fit into this beginner's guide because I think some of the new features are actually pretty awesome and things that even the beginners are going to want to know. So when you first purchase the app, I think it's around $10, £10 in the UK, which I'll, I'll just say off the bat is is incredibly good value. Now, the, I know there are a lot of free apps out there, maybe even some relatively decent good uh, free drawing apps, but with Procreate, you're getting practically a Photoshop program, not with every single feature, but increasingly it, it covers most of the main bases these days. And for around that $10, 10 pound, you will get updates all the time. So you pay once and then all the subsequent, all the, the you know future updates that they're gonna bring to the app are gonna be contained within that first purchase. So it's gonna be free from that point on. So a really wise investment. I can't recommend this strongly enough. I've been producing my own artwork over the last sort of three, four years now with Procreate. And it's it's the only program, it's the only app that I will turn to to actually create. I do prefer producing digital work now than paper and pencil. Um, I've, I've totally transitioned to digital. And this is just an amazing way to work, I think. When you arrive in Procreate, you'll be confronted with something similar to this, except that it won't have my paintings in there. It will just be the Procreate, and you probably have some default images that they give to you, so you can see sort of sample artwork. Um, and then obviously, the first thing you're going to want to do is to create your own canvas. Now, up in the top right area here, there is a plus symbol. You've also got photo import and select. Now, select means that you can do things, manage the actual files that you perhaps have in here. Once you click on them, it'll give you options of sharing, duplicate, delete, preview, etc. We're not interested in that at the moment. When you get here, presumably you're looking to actually start creating. So you can import if you have files saved into your files system on the iPad, or if you want to insert a photo, you click on here and it will insert something from your photos gallery. But I imagine really you're going to want to start creating a new canvas. So when you first come into the, uh, the default sizes that actually Procreate provides, you're going to find some really useful proportioned selections here. Now, typically, un unless you're going for a square, I will go for an A4. Once you click on the A4, and if you start drawing on it, you'll find that you have to zoom in quite a lot for it to go pixelated. So I think personally, and most of my paintings that I create on Procreate are actually in A4 or something similar. Yeah, so this one's A4, that's actually double, so that's more like A3, but within the A4 size setting, you can see it, you're getting plenty of detail. You can zoom in quite a lot. You're not losing clarity on the A4. You can really do full detailed pieces of work. It's perfectly big enough. So if you want to change the name of a file that you've actually created, you just click on the name that's there. You can see, so it's in white writing. Click on it, edit it, change the name, click back out, and then it'll adopt the new name that you've given it. So once you open a new canvas, you'll have a blank page, obviously, and then Presumably, you're going to want to start drawing or painting or adding something to it. Now, the most important feature you'll need is the brush tool. Now, initially, you might be able to draw with your finger. Now, you'll notice when I do it here that nothing happens. Now, I think this is a really important place to start. If you have the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil, then you're going to want to do this. If you don't have those things and you have an older iPad and you're either using your finger or an older generation stylus rather than an Apple Pencil, then you don't need to worry about this. But for the majority of people who are using an Apple Pencil, you'll want to do this. So you go into settings, or you go into the wrench symbol rather, you go into preferences, onto gesture controls, and then if you go into general, the way that I disable any accidental marks, either erasing or adding brush marks with my fingers, is to tab this. So if you just do disable touch actions, now it will only perform gestures at this point. So now with my fingers, I can so zoom in, um, I can rotate. There are other additional things I can do as well, but it, I won't accidentally draw with it. So if I just turn that back off again, you'll see what could potentially happen otherwise. Now that's sometimes that's fine if you're busy drawing with your pencil, and it's not a problem, but it's easy to, you can see with my knuckle now, it's easily done and it could just be little dots, little marks that you do all over your canvas and you really don't want that. 
So like I say, go into your gesture controls, disable touch actions within the general settings and you're good to go. The only thing that will make any difference on the canvas now is your stylus, your Apple Pencil. Whilst we're on the subject of Apple Pencil, when you first start to use it, the default settings for it, I think, are not quite, well, for me personally, I didn't find them quite right. I find that I had to put a little bit too much pressure on with the Apple Pencil and it didn't feel natural in the same way that a pencil or a pen would on paper. So in order to fix that, you can go onto the wrench symbol again or the spanner symbol and you go onto what's called edit pressure curve. Now you can see the curve that I've got there. If you look at it by default, that's the way it's going to come. But what happens then is if you, if you draw lightly, nothing happens. You have to press on quite hard to make something happen. And it's almost, it feels very strange. It almost feels like it's not responding, not working. Whereas as soon as you turn it to a curve, so the beginning pressure is quite steep. When I press on lightly, then you'll start to get more of a mark. I'll do that again, perhaps even make that steeper at the beginning. So the light marks now respond. It actually gives you a mark, even when you're only pressing on lightly, which is much more like paper and pencil. So they're the two main things that I would recommend that everybody does initially. They're a little bit more advanced settings, if you like, but once you've done them, I think that you never need to adjust them again. That's it, you're good to go. So in terms of the other main things that you're gonna to want to know about, you're gonna to wanna to know about brushes because they're gonna be the main tool, presumably, you're going to use to actually create things. Moving along here, obviously that is the brush. This is a smudge tool, this is an eraser, and this is how you control layers, and this is your colors. These are the most important sections, I would say. So to start with, you've got your brushes. Scroll through here, you might have the option of adding more later on as well, but you're gonna have a quite a good list of different brush types. All I can say is click on them, try out the different brushes. Now, within the settings of each of the brush types, there's just loads that you can do to amend it. I strongly recommend that you don't do that unless you really know what you're doing. I, I generally will put something on default. So if I'm on sketching, I'm on 6B pencil, I'm typically going to leave it alone. I'm going to put it pretty much as it was by default because Procreate are pretty sensible. Their default settings for everything, I think, are pretty intelligently created. So I think you'll be fine just sticking with the default. Only if later on you get more familiar with the app and you get more specific in terms of what you need and what you want, then learn about the adjustments of it. But to begin with, if you just want to get started creating, then just pick the brush types, stick to the default settings, and you'll, you'll not go far wrong with that at all. So obviously now we can draw. The Apple Pencil, if you press on lightly, you get light marks, you press on more. Now it can also control the width and the opacity, the strength, saturation of the, the color. That is something contained within the, the settings of each individual brush and that's fine. But also you can set it here. So you can change the brush size with the slider and you can change the opacity. So really important things, those. Although having said that, to a certain extent, once you know your brush size and your opacity, if you set it somewhere in the middle, you press on lightly, you're going to get lighter marks. You press on more, you're going to get darker marks. So actually the Apple Pencil itself will, will cover a large range of the opacity anyway. Now, if you've got, let's say you've got something down there and you want to smudge it. Now again, the smudge tools uh, come with all the different settings that a brush tool would, so it's exactly the same. Personally, if I'm looking to smudge things, I'm looking to blend them in more, especially if I'm using paint. Um, so I, I tend to put it on something like a soft airbrush. That's not to say you can't do it with the other brushes, but I think a soft airbrush is pretty cool. And then you can just sort of blend it in like this. And if you turn the opacity down, you can see it, it really does it in a much lesser way. Turn the opacity up and it's much more extreme. Likewise, the eraser does exactly the same. So control the size, control the opacity, press on lightly and it erases a little bit, press on more, it erases more. If you set the opacity to full, press on lightly, it almost erases, but only when you really press on fully does it properly erase. Again, just like with the smudge and the brush, you can choose your different brush types. I tend to try and go for something that is most similar to the actual experience of using an eraser, a rubber, so I, something like this. A medium airbrush would be kind of cool for that. And perhaps for me, the most important option up here, or one of the most important is the actual layers. Now, if I move on to one of my paintings and you can see the different layers that I've used. So, I mean, by no means is this a huge amount of layers. It's a, it's a good amount, but some people use say like a hundred, it depends on the size of the canvas you use. The larger the size of the actual canvas, the fewer layer options you're gonna get. If you use something sensible like an A4, you're gonna get the option of adding 
loads of layers. Now, the way that you add a layer is to press the plus symbol at the top, it creates a new layer, uh, and then you should be able to work into that. It's put it down there. Initially, when you're first creating layers, it will put it at the top. So if I go back to my blank canvas and show you that, and I'm creating a layer, you can see it's putting it immediately above, and I create another one, and you can see here, I mean, I've got the newest iPad that comes with more gig more ram so it does give you the the facility the ability to create loads and loads of layers i mean i'm going to get bored now before it runs out of layer options depending on the settings depending on the ipad you're going to have options to produce a lot of layers really useful if you're not confident about the additional elements you're going to add and you need the, the kind of security of having another layer then later on if you decide that you've got two parts of a layer and i'll show you this now so let's say there's something on layer 26 that i've created onto my brush and there's something on 25 that i've created and I like that element and I like that element and I'm confident that I don't want to change either of those elements and I want to keep them then you can pinch them together and now they are on one layer they are merged we need to be confident at that point that you're not going to want to adjust it because once you've merged it um, it's going to be more difficult to actually change now having said that when you've first done something it is possible to undo and redo just like you might do in say Photoshop now the way that you do that is double tap with two fingers that does your undo and three fingers will redo now depending if, if you've gone further along and you think you've realized that you've made a mistake way earlier on, then you're probably not going to be able to do that because you might have done additional things since you made the mistake and you don't want to undo them as well. So that's why having things on separate layers is quite useful. Within the layers, there's all sorts of different things you can do. I don't want to get too bogged down in this because this is something you can see in a full app guide like the one I've mentioned and that is in the description. But just to briefly give you a sense of it, if you click on the layer, you'll see there's all sorts of settings there. If you click on the end, there's all sorts of settings there. There is an opacity slider which perhaps is going to be the most useful one for beginners so if I click on something you'll see the difference you can see there it full I click on the N and I'll turn it down I'll turn it up and you can see the effect that that makes and obviously you've got the little tick in the box and if you untick it, it well it makes it not visible and you tick it again it makes it visible if you slide to the left you can duplicate or delete that layer they're probably going to be the main things you need to know straight away and you tap on it and then you've got this selections but to begin with, you're probably not going to need too many of those things. The only thing that perhaps you're going to need is the opacity, the ability to merge, the ability to create new layers. I think with those options, you're going to get quite far initially. Now, the next option up here is your colors. Now, you can see I've got various different color palettes created. Um, you have different view, views of looking at your colors. So you've got down here, um, you've got the disk. So you choose your actual hue, your color. Then you can choose whether it's very dark black or very white, very bleached out so you don't even notice the colors or a very saturated version too. So you can choose within the center the type of strength of color and then around the disc you can choose the, the actual color itself. Now within the classic view you've got something quite similar. You've got a slider for choosing the color and then within that box you can choose the color as well and you've also got something called values which controls all the sliders here for the different elements of the color and you've also got hexadecimal codes which you can type in and on my landscape tutorials for example i will provide those codes you can type them in press return and then it will create it up here we need to then once you've selected it is go down here and it will put it there within your color palettes if you press and hold the colors you get the option to delete them if you've got a color up here you like then click it here and it will add it. If you've got an image already, say, well, in a lot of cases, what I'll do is I'll find a photographic uh, image that I like the color palette of already. And once I've got that image within Procreate, you can go to the color that you really want to select. It helps if you zoom in, really find the color. So let's say I want that color, press and hold, and then it will appear up there and it's there. So click on there now, and let's say I want to put it down here and it's put it in my color palette. Change your mind, press and hold, delete it, it's gone. So this is something I use a lot. There are other ways that you can do this. If you press the little symbol here between the sliders, a little box symbol, and you move your colors along, you can see in the top half of this ring shape, it's showing you the color that you're now selecting. And usefully, it also shows you the previous color that you were using too. So you can see, well, I hope you can see, in the bottom half of the ring is your previous color. In the top half of the ring is the color that now that it's going to select. So if I want that kind of yellowy color or that more orangey color at the top, then 
I do that, let go, and now it's put it there for me. That can be quite useful if you know you want a similar color to what you've just had, but a slightly lighter version or a darker version. Well, you can see the orange on the bottom half of the ring that I had before, and the new selection is gonna be the top half. And so now I've got a slightly darker version of the color that I was using before. Various different ways of selecting colors, all useful, uh, have the different applications. Personally, I, I judge colors a lot by eye. I'm a traditional painter. Before I, I used to do digital work, so I'm used to spotting colors mixing colors um, but if you're not sure how to do it then you can easily find a, a reference point a, a photograph click or press and hold and build up your color palette in that way really useful tip I think now another recent addition which uh, wouldn't be covered in the main app guide that I've created because it's one of the update features is the ability to use shapes now if you've got um, if you've got an idea of the kind of shape that you want to create let's just say you want to draw a square and you're not going to be very good at drawing squares freehand it's not a problem now because all you need to do is have a go at drawing the square when you've reached the end of it press and hold and you can see here it's kind of straightened all the lines for you now that's not to say it's going to be a perfect square but when you let go you'll notice that that top bar has now changed to edit shape and you can change it it gives you the option of keeping it as a quadrilateral which means that you might want to pull it and make a strange shape from the corners or sides a rectangle in which it's 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 perhaps stretched it so it's not a full square but it's at least made the sides sort of parallel with each other you know, or you've got the option of a, a full square so really easy selection of a square there you can adjust it and make it a rectangle um, or you can pinch it from the corners and change it into a distorted version of that as well if you are happy with the square shape but you want to make it bigger or smaller then that's fine just click back off it now and then obviously you have the ability up here i say obviously i've not got to these features yet but you can change the the proportions change the size of it that way so likewise if you want to create a circle press and hold ellipse created as it says initially you've got the option of changing it to a circle and it's done it for you now obviously the the width of the line there has changed slightly if you wanted less of that then there are ways of doing that later with your brush type so for example if you knew you wanted an absolute even edge there's less changeability with a technical pencil doesn't matter as much depending on how much you press on it doesn't really change anywhere near as much edit the shape and now you've got a pretty damn good circle with an even line all the way around it. So once you've got a shape, and it, it might not be a shape, it could be any kind of element on your canvas, and you want to do something with it, you want to move the position of it, you want to distort it, well that's what this, I was just showing you that briefly anyway, but that is what this tool does. So you can just move, simply move it around, or you can, I mean, there's various different options here, so you can flip it, you don't notice what that's gonna do with a circle, but you can flip it horizontally, you can flip it vertically, uh, you can start to rotate it, and uh, you can make it fit to screen. Well, there is the option of this interpolation here, which means that you can basically, there are all sorts of different things that you can do to that. I, I wouldn't worry about that initially, that's something you can get to at a later point, but just to begin with, I think you're gonna have plenty of things that you can do just with the basic sort of adjustment uh, parts of that, transform elements, I should say. So pinch it in from the, the sides, make it more of an ellipse, however you need to go. Okay, in terms of the other tools that are actually along here, you've got the selection tool. Now there's all sorts of ways that you can use this. Generally, you're going to do pretty well with the freehand version, especially if it's an element that you can draw around with the Apple Pencil. So let's just say that I'm drawing that element. I'm gonna do it as a shape around here. Close that selection, and now I can do anything with that. So for example, so I could move that part, that selection around. I could choose to go into my smudge tool and smudge that out. And then when I select that again, you can see that it's, it's permanently done that. Obviously I don't want to do that to my painting, so I'm gonna go back, uh, undo all of that. Another way that you can do selections within the selection tool, there are different ways. There are automatic versions. You can produce rectangles or ellipse for your selections. But if you have a straight line, you want to do it freehand, but there are elements that are straight lines. Well, there's different ways you can do that. So for example, you're up to that point, you wanna do a straight line now from there to there, where you just click the next destination point. And to be fair, you can do that a lot without having to draw, make contact with it. If there's various different straight lines, it's a really useful way of doing that. You always have to double back, complete the loop by clicking on the circle, and then you can do anything with the selected area there. If you want to select the opposite of that, you can simply go and invert, and now it's selected everything in the background, but this area is masked off. So if you wanted to change something with the smudge tool, say for example, it will only smudge what's in the background there and not what's selected in there. Now, it's not very clear that because I've done it on 
a separate layer there. So if I go onto that layer, you'll see it much more clearly now. So it's selected and blurred everything outside of that selection area, but not on the inside. Again, I don't want to do any of that. I'm going to go back, make sure that none of that has actually happened to my painting. But there you go. Now I'm just going to go on to this layer, select it, and I'm going to show you what's in here. So this is your adjustments. There's various different things you can do. You can change your opacity, although you can change your opacity to the layer there anyway. But within that, you can add blur. So if you want, you clicked on it and you slide it with your finger along, you'll see that it's created motion or Gaussian blur. You can create a motion blur again, similar kind of effect. You can move your finger around depending on the direction of the blur you want. I don't want any blur, so I'll undo that. You've got a perspective blur. Again, you can choose your blur point and then you can choose the degree to which you're blurring it. So lots of different options there. You can change the color balance. Not something I do very often, to be fair. Um, hue saturation, you can change the, the hue, the saturation brightness, all these it could be really useful features, especially if you've got one detail that you want to change. It doesn't really work well when you're changing a whole picture because presumably you've got the levels of things just right. You're not going to want to change everything wholesale. But if you've got one element that is on a separate layer that you want to adjust, then that could be really useful. Again, just experiment. I don't tend to use things like sharpen uh, or noise, but there might be use cases out there that you can think that's really useful. Personally, that's not for me, but that Obviously, it depends what you want to do. Now, the next thing here is the spanner or the wrench tool. Now, I've got it on pressure curve because I was looking at that before. This is going to be a really useful feature or element to procreate in which you want to do some things with your actual image. So this is the point where you can add things. So you can insert a photo or a file. You can cut, copy, paste details. Wouldn't worry about any of that initially. One new area that is useful is adding text, however. So it immediately creates a box. You type something. Now you're not going to be able to see that. That's fine. So you go and edit text. Gives you all sorts of font options, different style options, different design elements uh, to that. You can sort of orientate it to the left or the right or center it. You can change it to capitals. Um, the reason you can't see that is because the current color that I've got selected is a dark gray. If I change that to white, you're going to now see the text much more clearly. Click on the color again. It goes back into the edit options. So I'll show you here. You can change the size, the kerning. You just have to try these. Again, you can change it from capital to lowercase. You can change your font types all different fonts, bold version. You have to experiment, play around with that. You can change the size of your box. You can reposition it. In terms of the layer type, it is actually a text layer. If you wanted to do something with that layer, say for example, rotate it, flip it upside down or whatever, and you go, then it's not going to make much of a difference. However, if I start to distort it and then click back on here, you'll notice now it doesn't have that little A symbol, which means it isn't a text option anymore. So I can no longer, on that layer, I can no longer actually edit it. It's now become an image file because I distorted it. It's not the kind of format that is something you can edit it as a text. So you need to be careful with that. But as long as you've not doing anything unusual with it, you should be able to keep it as a text layer. The reason, the way you'll know that is it's got an A in the box there, okay? Ignore the fact that I've wrote text. Whatever I would have wrote there is what it would have uh, actually shown. So click on the keyboard. I can show you that, for example. I go on my layers. You now say it says writing in there. The main point is it should show the A symbol. But as soon as you go on that layer, and if you do something like distort it so it no longer is something it recognizes a as a simple text. You can see it just said text layer rasterized. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you'll know what rasterizing a, a layer is. It just means it turns it into an image. So it no longer has that A. It's now an image contained within that box, just like the other layers. So I think text is an amazing extra new addition. I can see myself using that rather a lot. So in terms of your canvas, another new feature that I think is going to be crucial there's lots of things you can do. I'm not going to get too heavily bogged down into those. I'm just going to do the basic ones. So crop and resize are perhaps going to be the most important ones. So you can change the size of your canvas. You can actually extend it if you want. I mean, there are limits to that. Depending on the the, um, the image size you've already selected, it might limit, restrict you, but you can certainly change the proportions of it. Or like I say, if you want to crop it, this is something you couldn't do previously. And it was a minor frustration uh, is that you'd have to edit it in your images, in your photos. If you had a painting, you're finished, but you only wanted a selection of it, you'd have to do that in some other way. Um, but now you can actually do that within this. So let's just say you've cropped that, it's cropping it there. It's only got a selection of it. I don't want to do that as it happens. So I've just put it back. But 
a very useful feature nevertheless. One of the things you are going to want to do is share it in some capacity. Now you can choose your, once you've clicked on the share symbol, you can choose your file type. Let's just say, I mean, JPEGs are fine, that they're, they're lower file size, but generally I prefer to save things as a, as a Procreate file in my file system, or if I want to share it, save it as an image, I'll share, save it as a PNG. Bit slightly bigger, but it doesn't you know, condense the file. And then you can save it or send it to wherever you want. But again, you've got the option of Photoshop files, Procreate files, that preserves all the layers. If you want to flatten it down as an image, you've got your other flatter versions. Having said that, you also have the new edition now of PDF files where it sends a, an image of all of your layers. So if you opened it as a PDF, you'd have various pages where it shows each individual layer, if that's something you wanted. Uh, and likewise, it would create PNG uh, images of all the different layers you've got as well, if that's something that's interesting to you. You've got the video option. Now, if you've set it so that it has a time-lapse recording, you can then go back and watch your painting evolve. I haven't done this for that, for that one. It's an older piece of work anyway. And it also takes up space on your iPad. So you've got to be aware of that. It is actually obviously saving all that data. It is a, a video file, which will store and take up space on your iPad. And obviously you can export. You get your preferences, which I was touching upon briefly before. You can change the interface here, which might be something useful to you To If you're outdoors, you can change the sliders so that they're on the other side, if that's more convenient to you. The other things might be useful, but again, you know, it, it depends at what point you are at. So if you want to dig deeper, then you can go into the other things too. But I'm just giving you the basics so you can get started. And then you've got some help options as well. You can learn what's new, for example, but I've pretty much covered most of those anyway. Anyway, I intended this to be quite a short video and I've overrun by probably twice or three times the amount of, of time I intended to do this. But there's, there's just so much to this app. I mean, I've tried to condense it down to the essentials, things that you're probably really going to want to use initially. And I hope that's been useful. If you want more detailed versions or explanations of the features, then there is a, a fully detailed guide down in the description. And also just check around on, on YouTube generally. But I think if you're just looking to get started, I think the things that I've shown you here should enable you to do that. If you've got any questions, put them down in the, the, uh, the comments section. I'll either get around to them or we've got such a good community of my subscribers and people watching my videos that people tend to help each other out as well and answer each other's questions so that's brilliant so anyway enjoy using procreate subscribe to my channel if you want to catch more videos like this and i shall uh, see you again